Welcome back, everybody. It is the afternoon session of day three, and we have a powerhouse session here today um, on a topic that so many of us uh, continue to have conversations about. You know, literally yesterday in our breakout sessions of the Pre-Sales Leadership Collective Pre-Sales Influence Session, compensation was talked about a lot. It's a hot topic right now, and we have a really incredible group of folks that are here to uh, present on the topic and then get into an ongoing discussion. So I'm going to introduce Carrie, who's going to take it from here. Hey, Carrie. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, I'm really excited to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good, ever, uh, good, good evening, everybody. I guess we've got people from all over the world. Uh, for those who, who don't know, it really does pay to be persistent. I've been bugging James to do a comp-related session for Pre-Sales Collective for about 18 months now, I think, since the summer, sort of the spring of 2020. So uh, I finally wore him down. It took a year and a half, but here we are today. So uh, thanks Gary, for having I would me. like to rebuttal and say, you know, it was a great, it was a long sales cycle, but you provided value. I was convinced as the buyer and said, wow, this compensation session is going to be great. So appreciate the persistence. Uh, awesome. My my uh, my sales VP is asking me why I'm not faster at closing, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, quick introductions, and then we'll get into this. Prior to becoming uh, a, a demo coach, I'm the president of Pre-Sales Master, but prior to becoming a demo coach, I spent over a decade in the incentive compensation and sales performance management space uh, as a pre-sales leader at companies like Verisint and IBM. And so while comp is important to pretty much everybody, I've really sort of lived and breathed it for a good portion of my professional life. And what I personally envisioned for this particular session was to provide some insight along with the rest of this amazing panel in terms of ways that better comp plans can drive improved behaviors and results in your organizations and potentially how to overcome some of the common compensation challenges faced by pre-sales leaders. So before we jump into it, uh, let's get the rest of the panel introduced. Uh, I'm going to take turns here, just having you guys introduce yourselves, and and please let everyone know uh, one of the, one of the top things you're looking to sort of get out of this session as well. Ted, why don't we start with you? Uh, sure. Hi. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Ted Briggs. I'm a uh, principal at Better Sales Comp Consultants. This is my 34th year of all things doing sales incentive design, and and as we like to say, pre-sales is also part of sales, so it's the same thing. Um, I think the one thing I'd like to get out of today is to give people specificity around really creating job clarity so that the plans can really be impactful uh, and designed to create the right motivation for people to want to stay and keep performing. Awesome. Thanks, Ted. Joanne? Yeah, thank you. Um, thrilled to be here. Thrilled to be on this panel today. I'm Joanne Powers, Group Vice President of Pre-Sales at Oracle. Um, I've been in pre-sales longer than I care to admit, so I'm going to skip that fun fact. What I want people to take away from my comments today, though, is apart from just some healthy discourse on the impact of uh, various components of comp plans, is that as a result of the last several years, I believe people want to work differently, and therefore they want to be compensated differently. That's what I'm going to be focusing on. Great points. Awesome. Jeff? Hey, everybody. Thanks, uh, Carrie. Thanks for having me. Uh, so Jeff Margulies, I run the uh, solution consulting organization here at uh, ServiceNow. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess for me, probably the big one is uh, to let our counterparts, compatriots, colleagues know in the general pre-sales world that uh, um, the big money is not just reserved for the sales reps. We can get paid too. So excited to hear about, uh, you know, um, some great things going on the compensation side of pre-sales. Awesome. Can and should be paid uh, accordingly, for sure. Thanks, Jeff. All right, so let's uh, let's jump in. Ted and I are going to cover some content here, and then we're going to open up uh, for some Q&A and discussion with uh, with Joanne and Jeff. So without further ado, it looks like we're going to go past the 15-minute break. <laughs> there we go. We are back. Okay. So I doubt I'd get much disagreement with the statement on the left here. Right, getting compensation right is absolutely critical for just about every company out there. And while we'd all like to believe that everyone in our organization will always act in the best interest of our team or company, the reality is that compensation drives behavior. 
And so the key is designing comp plans that drive the right behaviors. And lest you think that poorly designed comp plans won't actually cause people to work against their organizational or team goals, consider Amazon's hire to fire practice, where managers were intentionally hiring people just so they could turn around and fire them. It turns out that some Amazon managers had a target rate for annual turnover. They were expected to lose through both voluntary exits and termination a certain number of people every year. And if they didn't meet their unregretted attrition rate targets, they were expected to make up for it the following year. Now, measuring the rate to track that rate to track the health of the organization isn't the problem. In fact, it's probably a really smart thing to do. The problem was that those managers were actually rewarded for meeting those targets. So rather than get rid of someone they wanted to keep, they were hiring people that they normally wouldn't just to later turn around and fire them to hit their goals. Now, what's even more curious is that the purpose of the goal was being prevented by this artificial new behavior. Employees who would normally fall at the low end of the performance spectrum and hence be in line to be terminated were now staying because it was these hire to fire folks that were being released instead. Now, Amazon doesn't actually have a formal hire to fire policy, but it has become part of their management culture as a way to protect their team from these artificial turnover goals and then more importantly, a desire to hit their incentives in the least possible pain, in the least painful way possible. So what are the broader implications? Well, driving the right behaviors has a material impact on the results at both the individual and the organizational level. CSO Insights, which is the research division of Miller Hyman Group, did a study that showed that organizations where comp plans consistently drove precise selling behaviors had 7% higher revenue attainment across the organization and a massive 33% more salespeople who met or beat their quota. What's amazing is that despite that, according to Vivian's winter 2021 state of pre-sales report, 40% of pre-sales leaders don't believe that their team's plans are effective at driving the right behaviors. So there's a lot of potential revenue and earnings if those organizations can get it right. getting used to these uh, slides, sorry. So we need to get the right plans to drive the right behaviors. But compounding the issue is that competition for talent, as we all know, is tougher than ever, right? Competition by, compensation by definition is simply the act of providing someone with money or other things of economic value in exchange for their labor or efforts, right? After all, almost all people are, at least to some degree, money motivated. If they weren't, they would, be uh, they would be volunteers, not employees. Now, generally speaking, we all know the most money motivated individuals as a group tend to be salespeople. And you know, while pre-sales role in the organization tends to vary by company, we are by definition of the word part of sales. And so to both attract new talent and perhaps even more importantly, to retain our existing talent, we have to pay people correctly. Consider some facts. According to our friendly host at the Pre-Sales Collective, there are somewhere close to 50,000 open pre-sales jobs worldwide. That's a lot of competition for a labor pool that is not big enough to easily fill those seats. It's therefore also a golden opportunity for existing SEs to find a better paying role somewhere else. If people do leave, most of us know the replacement costs are massive. When you factor in separation costs, lost time in the field, acquisition and training costs, estimates range anywhere from six figure, low six, six figures to three times someone's salary just to replace someone. And lest you think that your team is loyal and won't leave, consider that according to HubSpot research, 40% of those in sales roles will leave their job for just a 10% increase in pay. There's another angle here as well. It's not just about the amount and the way that you pay people. It's also that you pay people accurately and on time. Ultimate Kronos Group research found that 49% of U.S. workers will start a new job search after experiencing only two problems with their paycheck. So we need to get comp right. And there may not be anyone out there better at helping sales organizations do that than Ted Briggs. So I'm going to pass it over to Ted here <laughs> to cover some of the key considerations in designing your comp plans. Hey, th thanks, Carrie. I appreciate it. 
Hey, um, so there might be a few others that are at least equally good. So I'll, I'll, like, I'll put a, a shout out to my colleagues out there in the sales compensation and sales effectiveness world. Um, we often have to remind our, our clients when we work with them that sales compensation is just part of the solution. And in fact, it's an important part and it does drive be, uh, people's behavior and, and their energy level, but it has to fit within the overall realm of sales effectiveness. And uh, just like pre-sales people and regular sales people, we have to think about how jobs are designed and how the organization is set up. This is a chart we use a lot with clients to talk about if pays the problem, where's the cause of the issue, right? So if what, why are, what are we trying to solve with a pay problem uh, that, we, that we may need to take a look at the other factors that are going on? And I'll, I'll call attention to a few of these things. Um, obviously, the roles are really critically important, how you've defined their roles, what their activities and priorities are, the structure, how people report up and who their managers are and what that has to do with what the priorities are of their managers versus them, uh, the size of the team and whether or not you have adequate headcount to actually cover your organizations and how you deploy people uh, is really critical. Um, a lot of people use, when pre-sales roles, use kind of a potting approach. They try to align various technical and or pre-sales engineering sales people to specific teams or, or individuals, perhaps that they can cons consistently work with the same group of people, um, but they don't oftentimes have the headcount to actually align to each of those various assignments. And one of my clients uh, at, uh, at a little company called Newbridge Networks, his name is Dick Berger, used to say to me all the time, he said, Ted, if you don't have enough headcount, you're never going to have a good sales comp plan. So, it, and it's true. If you don't have the right headcount and you can't staff the roles, then you start compromising how people are assigned and you have a hard time coming up with things like, like what's the right degree of risk and reward given that they're assigned to various groups, not just one group. Should they should they get credit for everything or just parts of those things? So each of these things have have implications for all of those elements of sales compensation on the right. How how much should you pay? How should pay progress over people's careers in pre-sales? Uh, what, what's the base to variable mix? Typically, these jobs are less aggressive, uh, but still have significant upside. Uh, typically, you see bonuses with these types of jobs. Um, as few measures as possible, given that there's few uh, fewer dollars at risk as it relates to these jobs. And then of course, crediting rules is a really critical one and you mentioned payout timing. So all of those are really critical elements uh, that we consider and we have to ask the question, what is it we're trying to pay for before we do this? Can you jump me to the next slide, Carrie? Yeah. So the, when we think about um, uh, consideration for pre-sales incentive designs. The first one is really what's the history of the plan? So the history of the plan means how how does the current plan that you've got, and I don't know if we have bullets that built here. Um, um, go, ahead, go ahead and put them all down there. Uh, the first, the history of the plan, first of all, is, is how have these people been paid before? Because the amount of change you try to inflict upon people is really uh, significant in terms of your ability to manage that change. And anything that changes pay five to 10% in any one period is gonna have a significant impact, even if you're just increasing it. Um, of course, it's a lot easier to increase than decrease it. Um, the path of the people to pre-sales, did you hire them into an engineering role then put them into a selling role? Did you acquire somebody through a, an organization and make them a product sales specialist who now is a supporter to an account executive? Are you integrating divisions? So the degree to which individuals go from either being pure engineering and not thinking of themselves as salespeople per se to people who were salespeople that are now sales support people or pre-sales people is really critical to their perception of what risk and reward should be. Um, there's a wide variation in what pre-sales roles do. I, I know our two panelists will speak a lot about that overall, but you can have a generalist who covers everything uh, you can have specialized people who deal with products or just sets of products or even just services that go with your products. So you don't necessarily have somebody that covers all of the deal, but yet they're on the team trying to support the entire deal. Uh, and sometimes you have 
differences in where in the sales process they work. They might just do demos. They might just do proofs of concept. Uh, they might actually be the person that's critical to the handoff to the implementation team and participate all the way along through the implementation. So that's really critical in determining where and how they're impacting the deals that they're on and when you want to give them credit so that they stop paying attention to the deal on a going forward basis and move on to the next one. We'll talk about specificity of assignment and reporting. Really critically, it's, it's how well are you assigning people and is the reporting consistent? And that will be shown on the next slide in a minute. Uh, and then lastly, um, what kind of behavior do we want? Do we want them individually caring just about the things they're working on? Do they need to work in concert with the team? Uh, or do we need them to be doing both? And that really deals with what kind of crediting they get for the deal and whether or not they're on a full team sales number or just their part of the deal. And what might that mean about if people try to give certain products away at different discounts as part of making a deal more effective. So let me jump to the next slide real quick. This is kind of a, it's kind of a, a DEF COM chart or a hurricane kind of chart. If I had a Sharpie, I'd, I'd try and figure out where Alabama is with it, but I, I don't. So the key thing here is um, when you look at the assignments of the individuals, are they dedicated to working with a salesperson or a couple salespeople at the same time? Uh, or are they shared amongst a group of salespeople, uh, but that's still the same group that they work with? Or are they a pool that's really on call based upon when they're needed for which deals that require their talent. And I think we've all worked in each of those different environments in terms of how people might be assigned. Then there's the question of, do they report directly to the team leader? Or is there a matrix where they report up to a technical lead and then also to the sales lead? Or is it a purely separate management team that, that looks at how you performance evaluate and promote and 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 manage that individual on a day-to-day -day basis and even perhaps change their assignments, which can really inflict a lot of pain in how people uh, are measured and evaluated. And so really the green to yellow to orange to red is intended to say, the closer you are to that upper left-hand quadrant, the more you can have a specific and driving comp plan. And as you get further away from those two direct and dedicated models, you start to get into more compromises about what creates a great plan and whether it can really reward specifically for direct behaviors or whether you need to rely on management to do more of it. I'll hand it back to you, Carrie. Awesome, thanks very much for that, Ted. So, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here quickly, and then we'll get into the discussion. Uh, I want to spend a few minutes covering some of the common objections or myths around pre-sales comp and the associated challenges, and maybe some potential ways to circumvent them that I hear. So if this was an interactive webinar, I might bring up a poll here asking what everyone thinks the number 25.4 is. And you might guess that it's the average variable portion of SE pay mix or the percentage of SEs that are supporting post-sale activities. But according to Consensus's 2021 Sales Engineering Compensation and Workload Report, 25.4 is the percentage of pre-sales individual contributors who hold an individual quota. Now, why does that matter? Well, primarily because people with individual quotas make more money. That same consensus survey found that SE practitioners also carried uh, sorry, with individual quotas, also carried salaries that were 10% higher and variable pay targets that were 90% higher. So expected and potential pay are both higher with individual quotas. In an environment where people will tend to switch jobs or consider switching jobs for just 10% increase in compensation, every pre-sales leader whose team is solely on team-based plans, and according to that report, that might be the majority of you, should potentially be worried. And we haven't even mentioned that team plans tend to reward weaker or lower effort players, which can cause resentment from top performers, further impacting retention, which we know is a challenge. So why aren't more organizations leveraging individual quotas? Well, there's a number of reasons, but I'll address three of the most common ones that I've seen. So the first, I'm just sort of move these little bolts up here first. Uh, the first is, it's going too far is that there's a challenge around equitably allocating opportunities across uh, their team to ensure that everyone has a fair chance at hitting their number. 
right? And that can be because of unequal territory sizes. It could be the risk of being paired with an as, with a, a particular account exec who's really, really weak and is going to have a material impact on me hitting my number, right? Or it could even be that we have really inefficient methods for allocating out SEs to opportunities. One way to deal with unequal territory assignments is to assign SEs at a more macro level than the account reps that they support. So if your account execs are assigned at the state or the regional level, consider assigning your SEs at a regional or national level. Having the pre-sales team cover larger territories results in fewer outliers where territory size is gonna materially impact their ability to quota. And it also means there's less likelihood that an SE is gonna be stuck as the only person supporting a crappy account rep or that one a crappy account rep is gonna have a material impact on that particular SE's earnings potential. Another reason why a lot of people uh, complain about individual plans is that they think it's gonna turn our SEs into sales reps, some vampiric money hungry sales reps who aren't concerned about client outcomes. And my response to that is to restate the premise from the opening slide that compensation motivates behavior. If your plans are designed correctly, then money motivation and client outcomes shouldn't actually be mutually exclusive. Improved client outcomes and doing what's best for the client should actually lead to more closed deals and more money earned. And then the last objection that I hear a lot is that, you know, SEs are going to be less motivated to collaborate and work as a team. And my usual reaction to that is that collaboration and teamwork are often more appropriately and sustainably accomplished through team and company culture. I personally tended to avoid hiring anyone who was only motivated to help their teammates if they were compensated to do so. And there's always the whole idea that, you know, if instilling a culture of teamwork and camaraderie doesn't work, you can always use things like splits to ensure that every SE is appropriately compensated for their particular influence on any given deal. Finally, recognize that individual versus team doesn't have to be an either or situation. It's perfectly acceptable and in many cases preferable to have a hybrid plan with both individual and team components. So another common objection is that we, you know, we need to compensate on non-revenue related activities. And while some of these activities can be the basis for bonuses, they're more often appropriately handled as part of the standard set of responsibilities for the SE role. SEs usually have pretty generous salaries. That consensus study average showed that you know, average SE salaries are anywhere from 100,000 to 137,000, depending on your geography, which helps to justify the expectation that the job includes those other tasks as part of the standard expectations. To help with that, make sure that you're including those tasks in your formal job description so that new hires come into the role understanding what's expected of them. The other option is to use intrinsic or non-traditional motivators to reward employees. There are some really creative things out there like award point programs like Karma or Kazoo that encourage positive behaviors and help keep employees more engaged and motivated. But simple recognition is often huge. Internal or public call-outs can go a long way to both increasing morale and they don't cost anything but time. If you send out internal win reports or emails after a deal closes, make sure the SEs are mentioned alongside the account execs. I'm also seeing a lot more public shout outs on LinkedIn as they have a really nice benefit of not only recognizing the employee, but it also gives prospective new hires the idea that you value your team and will do the same with them if they join you. All right, there is no one size fits all plan as Ted called out. Um, but Joanne brought up a great point as well, and that there's a lot of change in the ways that we're working and how our teams actually want to be paid. So we have to be flexible. And you have a lot of tools in your tool belt to do so, right? It's not just changing comp mechanisms and payout types. You can also change pay mixes or the percentage of variable versus, uh, versus salary. You can change pay levels. You can change plan periods, quotas, payout and acceleration rates and rate tiers, and even things like product-based adjustments. One thing I will call out, though, you know, from a caveat perspective, is if your plans are different across the team, try to make them justifiably different because the truth will eventually come out and your differences should be defensible when you get challenged. All right, one final thought before we turn into the discussion mode. So 
the ability to easily measure or track the right compensation metrics should never be the reason not to implement the right plan. While some plans might be nearly impossible to implement in Excel, SPM or ICM solutions can easily automate almost any plan you can think of. And aside from ensuring that you can implement the right plans, SPM solutions also have a slew of other benefits. I'm gonna bring them all up here. They ensure payment accuracy, right? Which avoids morale affecting underpayments, right? Which can otherwise be a nightmare to uncover and correct, right? They offer full transparency in terms of how payment values were determined. There's nothing more demoralizing for an SE than closing a huge deal, thinking they're gonna get a great payout and then seeing a totally different number on their paycheck. They provide the ability to model out new plans, which allows you as managers to forewarn your teams if their past behaviors or performance might result in some significant change under the new plan, which can potentially avoid any surprises or disappointment. And the ability to forecast future earnings can be massively aspirational and it can motivate behavior. If an SE knows that they're only 10K in revenue away from an accelerator, they may behave totally different than if they don't know that. And finally, SE, uh, SPM and ICM solutions also help with team communications to help resolve disputes better. Okay, enough from me. There's it's been a lot of sort of uh, brain dump on here. We're gonna uh, pass it back to Ted here for one really quick slide on compensation best practices to consider, and then we're gonna switch gears into the discussion. So I'm gonna bring all these up for you as well. Not one too far. There you go. You're on mute, Ted. Ted, you're on mute. I don't know if you can hear me. Did I unmute again? Sorry. Yeah. My, my, my bad. Uh, the first two really deal with the fact that we need to balance both individual and teamwork in these roles. And you're completely right, Carrie. We can do hybrids or both. Somebody asked a question, how would you shift from one to the other? And my answer would be, Try using both for a while and modeling both uh, until you know how volatile the individual might, might work before you make it live. So testing quotas and testing crediting before you make it live give people a lot of confidence. Um, uh, upside is something you, I'm gonna go to number four there. Upside is something that you need to model and plan for. It's not just a rate you give. You need to say, hey, I want them to double or triple their potential payout. What performance level do people get to? How can I do that? How do, what rate will, do I need to use to get them there? So don't just use an upside rate that's either lower or higher because you think it looks better. Use something that gets people to that competitive upside that you want. Um, using goal-based plans is really the right way to go with these teams. However, we've seen a lot of success with people who pay bounties or significant deals that they, they have high contribution to outside of a team approach. So you can do a pay per deal, one-time payout that actually creates an incentive for having created a significant impact on a deal. Uh, you need to probably limit that to how many of those you can give out a year. Um, in this case, no more than two metrics for these jobs, three with salespeople, but two with, with, with pre-sales people. Um, I, I, it says you should uh, there later there that you should uh, make sure the measurement period is never shorter than the sales cycle time. Very true with these people as well. And keep keep your volume metrics as the primary goals of these. You in in the case of pre-sales people, never use MBOs. Use that as part of your performance management system, not your comp plan. Awesome. Thanks, Ted. Uh, James, do we want to, can we uh, cancel out the screen share so we can uh, get into discussion mode here? Awesome, thank you. Okay, so let's open it up. Uh, you know, would love to hear sort of from, from Jeff and Joanne uh, on a couple of questions. So first, maybe each of you can take turns sharing sort of the different sort of comp plans you're using, your sort of overall sort of comp philosophy with your teams. Jeff, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, both the number of plans and the philosophy. <clears throat> I'll start with the philosophy first, and then I'll talk plans. Uh, philosophically, at least for us here at ServiceNow, and, and even me personally, I believe in getting down to individual quotas tied to individual territories as fast as possible and as close as possible. 
Uh, we don't have that everywhere, but I would say about 90 to 95% <clears throat> of our broad um, pre-sales team is on individual base quotas. So, you know, I like to use the term, they are eating what they are killing for sure. And, and we, we um, I also believe in philosophy, it should be relatively unlimited too. So we have unlimited comp plans here. If you hit a hundred, a thousand percent of your quota, we will pay all the way up to a thousand percent of it. Uh, we have accelerators and then um, then we like to model it relatively closely to what their counterparts in the sales teams are. Now, I always give that caveat. Listen, the sales team puts a lot more at risk, so they should receive a lot more reward. And I, I fundamentally believe in that as well. Um, but <clears throat> uh, I don't know why we can't um, you know, be the benefactors of things like spiffs, bonuses, renewal bonuses, bounties, as an example, we do that as well, whether it's for new logos or some product-based thing, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're pretty much across the board. But it's interesting, you know, that we will have some flexibility though, because you, you can end up with some odd behavior. So we'll have a hybrid model as well. And we let our individual managers go and choose that. So what I mean by hybrid is we prefer everybody be on 100% individual, you know, or territory-based quotas. But quite often, we'll let them go 70-30, where 70% of their quota or variable component is an individual base, and 30% is on the team that they work within. And that helps with some of that collaboration, um, you know, teamwork, et cetera, where they're like, oh, hey, I'll help you out with that demo because I'm in sense because you're in my region, et cetera. And that we found that a pretty good balance. And I, I let the managers really just choose that because we have some SEs, as you can imagine. They want to they want to have huge comp plans and when get paid a whole bunch. They're like, no, I'll take the risk. Give me 100 percent of uh, my territory. I think we're going to kill it this year and we're more than happy uh, to let them do it. And then uh, last one around the styles of comp plans. We probably have oh at least 25 of them nowadays. It really depends. And it's what you uh, one of you said on the um, slides. It depends on their role. So they're very role dependent, whether it's field, specialist, partner, um, inside, et cetera. We will have a little bit different comp plan, but most of them follow that same philosophy. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Joanne, how about yourself? Yeah. Um, well, both you and uh, Ted made some great points in the opening presentation. Um, I suspect I'm going to be the dissenting opinion <laughs> on many of them. Uh, first, I believe there is a big difference between sales and pre-sales roles, and that the compensation plan should reflect that. I've worked for three software companies, and I've seen the results of comp plans from acquisition companies and, and talked to the SCs that came from different companies and different plans. And the plans that I've seen drive and reward the behaviors that we value as pre-sales professionals are the ones, for me, that are pooled aggregate revenue targets with a component, a balanced component of revenue target and goals and objectives. Uh, particularly if you do transformational deals, Fortune 500, rip and replace their supply chain, that's not going to happen in a fiscal you got to find a way to pay those people when that deal has not closed. It could be 18 months, could be two years. Um, I like to see a plan uh, with goals that encourage behaviors like business development, like customer care, innovation. Uh, as leaders, we want pre-sales teams to mentor each other, to freely engage in opportunities together, uh, to work with development to make the product better to work on initiatives, creating assets, and then be willing to share those because you're not competing with anybody else. Um, I'm gonna give you an example. It's from my own personal experience. Um, I worked at a, it was like a startup in Canada, the first selling loss in software. And it was just me and another fella, just two pre-sales people, me and his name was David Saunders. And uh, you know, over the course of one summer, I got the big juicy deal. I got given the biggest deal we had ever seen, <clears throat> pardon me. And it was gonna be five days of scripted demos, me alone. Okay, so I was prepping this the whole time. David was doing everything else, all the, all the other deals. At one point, I, said to, I thought, said to David, listen, I think we're gonna lose the customer on day two with all this content. I'm gonna build uh, demo books. Would you build a cover page for me? And would you take the tax script? Because that's not my sweet spot. So that you have to understand David is like Mensa smart, okay? One of the smartest people I've ever worked with. 
Do you know what he said to me? He said, I've been waiting for you to ask me what you needed help on. Yeah, I'd be happy to create a cover page for you. I'll take the tax script. And the reason was, whatever closed, we both got paid on. He didn't care what deals he was taking while I took the big juicy deal. He didn't care if I asked him to do a cover page. And that cemented for me the kind of culture I want. So really, we show people the way that we want, the activities, the actions that we value as an organization by how we pay them. And as altruistic as we all want to be, rightfully, people take their cues from their comp plans, and they should. That's my position on that. Yeah, no, that's great. I think it's a perfect illustration that you, your, your plans need to be flexible to your current situation. You, and you make a perfect point. If you're not going to close a deal because it's to your sales cycle, then being on an individual plan means you're probably just hitting, you're hitting a lottery. If you happen to be within that time when it hits, that's great. If you move on before it does, you're making nothing. So it really, you have to be flexible. It's a great point. And, and I think, Carrie, if I could just add on to that comment you made, um, you know, we're not salespeople. We're not taking the same risks they're taking. Um, we're doing the best we can in the demo portion of it. We're not doing the whole thing. And so I should get compensated for doing fantastic demos. This might have been lost at an executive level. It might have been a bias that had nothing to do with how I demoed. And I had no way to impact that. So you should get paid. The, the deal didn't close, but you should get paid. You did everything right that you could do. My opinion. Yeah, and I think, I, and Jeff, I think you made an interesting point too, where sort of you you give, it sounds like the manager manager is the option to choose the mix. And it sounded like potentially even the individual contributors are given the option in terms of the mix they want as well. Is that, did I interpret that correctly? Definitely a little bit more than manager than the individual contributor, but we'll, we'll take input from both. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and we're relatively flexible with that. I guess, you know, a little bit even to Joanne's point, uh, you know, there, there's definitely some downside to going the individual route, but um, I, I find if you build the right culture around it, people will just help each other out. They don't get too inwardly focused. Um, and then we have lots of support teams from it. From a pre-sales perspective that overlay onto a lot of our individual field teams, it's a lot of group selling here. I mean, you get into some of our big deals, you could have 10 SEs working on that and they're all going to get paid on these things. But when it gets down to the actual individual field base, I want them as tight to the customer as possible, tight to the sales rep as possible and not distracted with anything else beyond that because they get a ton of support from various other areas. And those other areas, by the way, they typically are on some kind of, you know, shared or whatever, you know, product based or, you know, it could be architects, et cetera. They're definitely in a shared type of environment, but <clears throat> the large portion are sitting in a more individual style. Yeah, great point. I, th I think that what, one thing that I think is important to recognize, and we talk about sort of the great resignation and the fact that there are so many amazing opportunities and retention is a challenge. And I want to ask each of you sort of what you're doing to sort of combat retention issues and, and attract new people in this competitive environment. But I think one thing we do need to consider is not just the environment and situation in our own companies, but also the fact that our, our potential employees could be looking at what else is going on at another company. So I may be super happy that I'm on a team plan today, but if someone comes to me tomorrow and says, you can make double by being on an individual plan at my company, I may need to find creative ways to sort of defend against that. So maybe that's a sort of intro to the next question. So uh, Joanne, let's start with you on this one. Sort of what are some of the mechanisms or changes that you've sort of run into or, or taken into account to sort of deal with these retention and, and, uh, and, and challenges around new hires as well? Okay, sure. Um, first of all, I think the fundamentals are there. Uh, you have to have a market uh, fair base pay for everybody. Um, I think everybody has accelerated increases, accelerated promotions, accelerated equity, spot awards, quarterly awards, all of those good things that we do to recognize our folks. Uh, but I think there's four other levers that really matter to people. And one of them is internal mobility. When you work for a larger company, like Oracle, for instance, and I knew this, I found this in myself and people that work for me, sometimes you get burnt out demoing. Sometimes you're kind of, you know, you need a break. And being able to try something else for a period of time, whether that's 
doing education or strategic messaging or, or customer care, um, it's good to explore other areas and have that opportunity. And I think that's one of the things that really attracts people to Oracle. Um, something else that we put in place to help with retention um, is what are called stay interviews. And there is a, uh, a thought leader in Silicon Valley, Dr. John Sullivan, who really speaks about stay interviews a lot. And the, the premise of it is rather than wait till people are leaving and ask them, why'd you leave? Why not talk to them when they're in your company and ask them, why do you stay? And then give them more of the things they love. And, you know, it's questions like, what makes a great day at work for you? Um, if you managed yourself, what would you change? So I've done stay interviews. And, um, you know, I've heard things like, I love mentoring. Uh, so I said to the manager, you have to mentor. Give, I love being one of two uh, administrators for this product. Great. You're one of two, indefinitely. So, you know, it's easy to make people happy if you give them the things that they love. I can tell you the one thing I have never had anybody say to me in a stay interview is, Joanne, if you could just get me another pair of corporate socks, I would be thrilled. <laughs> if you could just get me another logoed water bottle, boy, things would be wonderful. That I have never heard. Um, so I said there was four. There, that's two of them. The other one is empathy for the situation that people are in, especially now with the pandemic and um, you know, allowing people to change their work schedule being flexible around that, um, allowing people to ease into retirement if that's what they want to do, take a leave of absence if they need a break. Um, and the last one is really diversity and inclusion initiatives, sincere allyship, declaring it. Um, I'm on the Global Oracle Women's Leadership um, Executive Committee, and we talk about this all the time. Um, and in my own organization, we've implemented recruiting targets that emphasize diverse candidates. So I think all those things matter to people. I think they're important. Awesome. Jeff, how about yourself? Yeah, uh, Joanne made some <laughs> great points that we're, we're doing some of those as well. I mean, uh, I'll throw a couple others out, I guess. For one, um, you know, there's a little bit of a, a, you know, OTE slash pay war out there. And it's, it's a double-edged sort of, all right, listen, I, I can't have the entire team walk out. So we're going to have to take a, take a deep look at that. So that's, you know, some of the things that we're out there trying to do. But then I also have a bit of a philosophy of like, listen, we're not a prison either. So if people fundamentally want to leave for whatever reasons they've got, you know, that the, what is it? The dive and catch is some people like to call it. Is there, you know, someone um, attempts to resign, I think is a very slippery slope. We'll always look at it, but you know, I, I want to be a little careful of that I think you can just do some of the broad things, make, make sure that the broad teams understand what the purpose is for the company, what the goals are for the organization. And, and I only got to go on hope and prayer with some of it that they're aligning to some of those. I think they are, um, but that they understand that. And then again, a lot of things like Joanne mentioned, uh, you know, I work at a pretty high growth company. You know, we're, we're hiring lots of people, both within my team and, and external, but within the, the broad community of the company. I'm like, hey, you know, our skill set's highly valuable in many other areas like sales, as an example. As you can probably tell by now, I tend toward a more salesy oriented solution consultant. Guess what? A lot of our SEs will go into sales over here. And it's a great market and opportunity for them. Uh, then things like product marketing, product management, even a little bit of R&D, uh, marketing over in the partner organizations, et cetera. You know, we're, we're pretty flexible with, um, you know, what you do, where you do it, et cetera, and which, which is exciting, I think, to me and to the, you know, broader teams across the board. It's good to have, you know, I like to call it friends of the SE team across the company. In other words, ex-SEs that used to work in our team and some other organization because, we can call them for uh, for help, et cetera. You know, I, I honestly think this is a, just a point in time and it too shall pass as well. But uh, yeah, I, I loved hearing from Joanne and some of the interesting things that uh, she's doing because I can learn from that as well. Awesome. Well, I, I, I see James has popped his face back in, so we, we must be at the top of the hour. I know we could probably keep talking all afternoon, but uh, James, we'll pass it back to you. I just want to thank Jeff, Joanne, and Ted, thanks very much for uh, for joining me on this panel. This was great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh,
I want to thank you guys as well. Wonderful conversation. The Slack is on fire right now about compensation. So it sounds like we're going to have to continue this. Kerry, thanks for leading a great discussion and the presentation. Ted, thanks for adding the slides. Joanna, Jeff, love your perspectives. I uh, appreciate if you guys could spend a little time in the Slack. There's some good dialogue going on. We'll have to set up time again. So thank you so much for joining us.